Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Hensler. I'm with Lifelong Medical Care. Uh, I'd like to first thank Kim and Project Echo for this opportunity this afternoon. Ryan, if you're uh, with me, start, I... I think that you may be muted through your phone. Uh, I'm not muted. If you're joining by phone and you've muted yourself on Zoom, you press star six to unmute. Okay, you can hear. Great. Can, can, Kim, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Hensler. I'm the director of HIT for Lifelong Medical Care. I'd like to first thank Kim and Project Echo for this opportunity. Uh, with me, I have Sorelli Abara Hernandez. She's our virtual care representative. And also joining us is Crystal No. She's our telehealth coordinator. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sorelli, and I am the virtual care representative for Lifelong Medical Care. And um, as Ryan mentioned, thank you for having us here today. I'm not able to advance the slide here. Great, so a little bit about Lifelong. Uh, we were started in the 70s in Berkeley, California. Um, now we have about 45 service locations. We're across three counties. Uh, we have multi-specialty services, including primary care, integrated behavioral health, and dental. Uh, we serve roughly about 70,000 patients annually excuse me, active patients and about 275 annual visits. Um, one of the challenges that we faced kind of coming into the pandemic is we were coming off of a, a fresh EHR implementation. Uh, we were on two EHRs prior uh, for about eight years and we switched late January of 2020. So we were just getting our feet wet with, with Epic at the time. And you know, faced with the pandemic and shifting to telehealth, we kind of had to, to pivot rather quickly. And all of our prior kind of patient engagement tools and things that we had been so used to using, uh, including the portal, including robocall and text messaging platforms, uh, we were new to those new, newly uh, applications and platforms. So we we're still kind of trying to find our way. So we were presented with some challenges and really had to be creative and put various teams and uh, departments together to really kind of come up with an action plan uh, as we uh, partake on, on the telehealth. Um, and so with that being said, we um, found ourselves having to do a lot of outreach to patients, letting them know of our services uh, when the pandemic started and the um, Stay at home orders kind of came in. Uh, we were we shut down about 90% of our in person services. So we were really doing only things uh, like injections or women's health or things that required an in person visit where everything else was, was telehealth. And this was a big transition for both our, our providers, our care teams, and our patients. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, we started to find things that were challenges. We'll go ahead and advance the slide. Um, and so one of the things we found starting out is that it really was kind of the wild, wild west, so to speak, of anything and every kind of platform uh, to communicate with patients was being used. We had providers using FaceTime, Google Hangouts, you know, anything they could kind of get their hands on to conduct video visits. And where we were really challenged with that in the beginning was it was very difficult for us to support that, um, you know, as a as the director of the health IT team and EHR team, and we were getting help desk tickets coming in, whether it was for providers uh, or even getting reports from patients not able to connect. And so that's where we it really got us thinking about how, how are we going to support this? You know, this is really challenging. We've never really faced anything like this before. I mean, just coming off an EHR implementation, you know, we were you know, had a very increase in our help desk and support tickets. And that was very specific to a very specific application. And then now we're on to this, you know, 25, 30 different types of platforms that are being used. So we pushed very hard to standardize those platforms. Uh, fortunately, 
uh, we did have Zoom already as part of our organization for administrative purposes. We did do a very small behavioral health pilot uh, prior pandemic for telehealth. And so we had a little bit of foundation to work off of. Our Epic instance is through Ocean and we have Zoom integrated with, with that platform. So that helped tremendously. And there was another platform that seemed to be very favorable by many of our providers called Doximity. Uh, it has a little bit more clinical sense to it than say Zoom or FaceTime or other, other applications. And so we really started pushing that. And the, one of the benefits of Doximity versus Zoom as well is it didn't require an app or download from the patient side. It was almost like answering a call or, or clicking on a text that would open a URL and put them directly into the video. So that helped quite a bit. But as we kind of furthered along with telehealth, we were really finding a, a, a big challenge uh, with technology being a large barrier, especially being a community health center. And you know, a lot of patients that we, we provide services to are underserved. So having a little bit of gap in the technology, uh, whether it's access to Wi-Fi or and things like that, we are finding this strong need to have patient-specific support. We'd have patients calling into our call center needing assistance, uh, call, you know, emailing the provider, texting the provider saying, I need help connecting. I can't, you know, I don't have any help at home. I'm, I'm needing help to be able to log in. I really want to be able to see you on the video. And so that got us thinking about, about hiring a dedicated support role to provide specific support for telehealth itself, particularly the virtual visits, the video visits. Uh, we did have a prior role in our organization that handled a lot of our patient portal support, uh, everything from logins uh, to how to send a message to the provider. And so we thought about expanding that role. Um, and that's something we kind of pitched to our leadership team and seeing that that being a large barrier of being able to actually provide video visits. Uh, we're getting a lot of providers that say, I'm spending way too much time trying to help my patient get on the video and it, it's cutting into our visit time and I really just need to be able to convert to, to phone. Um, and so that really you know, got leadership thinking and, and so we were granted or budgeted the position uh, to hire a virtual care up. Uh, which Sorelli will speak to a little bit more here in, in just a minute. Um, so again, identifying that and being able to bring Sorelli on um, really allowed us to, to be able to, to provide that support. And we saw the increase uh, in the video visits and patients really loving having kind of a dedicated and direct support line to go to. It's kind of what we're seeing is we're calling it an extension to our call center where patients can call in and you know, click option eight and they'll be directed to Sorelli where she can assist them with whether it's my chart of getting logged in, creating an account, checking lab results, or being able to assist them uh, with downloading Zoom or how to prepare. Um, with an extension of to her direct line or to her, her role itself, we stood up two web pages uh, as part of our website that allows us to either, we can send that URL to patients through text, or we can mention on our website, you can go underneath the My Charter Telehealth page. And on those pages, which we'll show here in just a minute, we're able to provide information of what you can expect with the video visit, how to prepare for the video visit, links to do download of Zoom, um, you know, just various information that you know, what we kind of did is, is, you know, we cultivated all the questions and things that we were getting over the first couple of months and put those into kind of a Q&A to help provide that, that level of uh, su support for patients. And so, again, we're finding that being able to have that dedicated support has really improved, uh, you know, the morale, not only for our providers, knowing that they have an outlet um, to send the patient to, but again, also for the patient side. Um, one note I'll make just before handing it over to Sorelli is just, you know, talking about our transition uh, from our prior EHR and those tools that we had and we knew so well for so many years to then have, have new ones. So we worked very closely with our EHR vendor 
And we brought on another vendor, uh, WellText, which I know many folks uh, use out there for, for their appointment reminder or text platform. And we really used those and found, you know, having those patient engagement tools were so critical as we moved to kind of this virtual world. Because again, we had no real way of communicating to our patients. Typically we have bulletin boards, we have a waiting room TV that broadcast marketing, you know, ways that we're, you know, providers are saying, hey, we have this event coming up, you know, next week for blood pressure or a health fair coming up. We lost that, you know, the personal touch and ability of, you know, they really relied on their care team and going into the clinic to, to get, get that information. And so we really needed those platforms. And so, you know, we used our, our texting outreach platform to send text. It also does a phone call to be able to leverage that. We were doing emails, uh, you know, anything we could kind of do to get information out. We were, do, you know, even found ourselves doing, you know, letters and snail mail. Uh, to broadcast our services because shutting down 90% of, of in-person services was pretty significant for us. And so we really needed those, those tools and those came in so much handy. And one of the things that we really relied on and we saw such a, a drastic increase as we moved uh, you know, to, to Epic and the virtual world is the dependency of a patient portal. Um, and we started out with the transition of less than 2% of our patients you know, by the time we, we got into the pandemic, uh, which we're now close to 40% of our patients being up on a portal. And we've just seen that increase the ability of patients being able to request an appointment. Uh, they're able to send a message to their care team, check lab results. And so being able to have, again, these patient engagement tools or tools that allow patients to communicate to their care team or to their health center are so critical in these times. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Sorelli to, to share about her, her role as a virtual care rep. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, so I'll be going over um, the role of the virtual care representative and the type of work that I do with patients. And then I will briefly be talking about my experience um, with the behavioral health pilot. And um, I'll be showing also a quick demonstration, demonstration of our um, website. So um, the main role of the virtual care representative is to provide live facing technical support to our patients. So I help patients um, with their mic chart. So for example, if they need help with enrollment or navigating their mic chart. For example, if they need help with um, how to send a message to their healthcare team, um, how to add an attachment to that message, um, how they can view test results, uh, prescription refills, or for parents um, helping them um, log into their child's my chart and finding their immunizations for schools. So anything my chart related. Um, and then I also use our lifelong website as a guide to um, to show patients um, more information about my chart and how they can download the My Chart app uh, to their smartphone or their tablet. And then um, I have uh, my contact information on our website where patients can contact me either through email or phone. And then um, another, I also help patients with um, preparing them for their video visit. And so what really um, helped me understand more about the issues that patients were having was through this uh, 10 week behavioral health pilot that we conducted where uh, providers would identify patients that they wanted to connect with, but the patients did not have that support system at home um, to help them with any technical issues. So then providers would send me the referral and then I would get in contact with the patient and then um, help them uh, prepare for their video visit. And two main things that I noticed throughout this pilot was that a lot of patients needed help with um, just how to download Zoom onto their um, smartphone or their computer. Um, and then also uh, how to turn on their video and, and camera. So, um, so I would help the patient prepare and then so on the day of the appointment, I would uh, reach out to the patient and we would connect through video. 
And then I would, um, once the patient was ready, um, I would let the provider know that the patient was ready for their video visit and um, the provider would connect to the video call and then I would leave the patient and the provider and this would count as a successful handoff. So what we learned um, with this pilot was uh, the great relief that patients had having someone walk them through um, how to do a video visit and just helping them, um, you know, how to download Zoom, how to use Zoom and, and having the patient feel comfortable. Um, so that way they felt prepared for their any future um, video visits that they may have with their provider. And then um, I also would like to mention that um, through this pilot, you know, I, I am bilingual. So a lot of our, our patients that, that we work with are, are bilingual. So um, also just having someone, um, you know, that, that can speak their language was very helpful. Um, and then oh, the next slide. Um, so then here um, with this pilot, um, it also helped us um, prepare a screening and an assessment process that we use throughout our, our um, organization. So here, um, the first bullet point, you can see here an example of um, what we call an FYI flag. Um, and this is what anyone in our team, um, providers or anyone scheduling appointments, um, they can see right away if the patient is interested in the video visit. Um, so here um, on the right, top right, you have a screenshot, um, video visit preferred, yes. Uh, what kind of, if they have the right equipment, um, like a smartphone, desktop, um, good Wi-Fi connection, yes. Their, um, their comfort level on a scale from one to three, one, you know, not feeling comfortable using technology, three, being experts. Um, on how to use Zoom, for example. And then um, lastly, here we have the, the type of um, device, um, sorry, platform, either Zoom or, or Doximity. So, um, so yeah, so this is a, a very helpful tool that um, will help identify what patients are interested in a video visit. And then the next um, here bullet point, um, the mode. So the visit mode, as you can see here, um, so providers can also easily identify what kind of mode patients are interested if they want Zoom, video, proximity, phone call, or in-person visit. And then lastly, here all the way at the bottom, you have an example of the referrals that I get from providers um, where they can quickly screen a patient um, and a few things that they ask the patient to help me know a little bit more of what, what kind of technical support patients need is, uh, for example, if they need help with, um, with downloading Zoom or, um, you know, any other <laughs> technical support, um, and also what kind of device they will be using, for example, a tablet, a smartphone, desktop, um, and then the best time for me to contact the patient and any other comments. Um, some examples are, let's say they're Spanish speaking patients. And um, so then here um, I have, we have a quick uh, video of our website. So this is our lifelong medical care website. And right now here is our My Chart um, website where patients can read a little bit more about My Chart. They can log into their My Chart, read about the benefits, um, how to enroll. Here they can download the MyChart app and right here at the bottom is uh, my contact information and also how they can reach me through email. And then next um, here is our telehealth website where patients can read about, um, you know, what is telehealth and, and what qualifies as a telehealth appointment versus an in-person visit. And um, right here, Patients can read about how to prepare for their video visit. And right here at the bottom, once again, how they can contact me and, and I can um, reach out to the patient and, and help them prepare. Um, and then real quick, um, here is um, the handouts that we use um, where patients can look at on, on here on the left, you can see um, how patients can connect for Doximity video visit and 
here on the right is a little guide of how patients um, can connect to their Zoom video call. Um, so then I'll be handing it back to Ryan where he will be talking about the next steps. Thanks, Shirley. So what, what we you know, say or we coin is you know, telehealth is here to stay. I think after this last year and just kind of going through telehealth and providers, uh, you know, there's there's definitely a, um, we're seeing an, an uptick in you know telehealth as a whole and just seeing that they can see more patients. We've seen uh, a decrease in you know transportation barriers have always been something for our patients that is you know uh, can be related to to no shows. Um, so with that being said, and having telehealth now part of as our our care delivery system, uh, we're looking to increase uh, more language support. That's been something you know very traditionally is just having the English and Spanish support, uh, whether it's translators, uh, our education documents, those types of things, uh, is expanding those based based on the need of being able to provide that information. We're also seeing that with our EHR vendor and languages being baked into the patient portal, uh, other letters and handouts and education documents. Um, we actually currently have, uh, we're hiring for another uh, virtual care rep uh, based on the need and demand uh, for supporting our patients. Right now, um, Sorelli's role is very dedicated to uh, certain providers that need that. It's, it's not something that we've kind of gone out openly to the entire organization. It's been kind of we're slowly rolled out, but we're hoping that with hiring another virtual care up, that it will just become standard support across the board. And we want to be able to broadcast that widely uh, to provide that level of support for our patients. Um, we started a contract uh, with Doximity to have that integrated with our EHR, just like Zoom is. Um, so we hope that that will actually provide even more ease of use with not having the requirement of patients needing to download that app and providers would be able to call out directly from within the EHR. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We're looking at having that before the end of the year. Um, one thing that we used to do uh, years ago, uh, we're just kind of falling off, especially the pandemic, was being able to do on-site um, signups or education, or even where we'd have uh, at our administrative offices, opening up a classroom or a training room and having patients come in and learn about the patient portal or being able to provide the certain levels of education. So we're kind of excited and see that to be kind of the future also with our virtual care up and being able to provide you know, patient education uh, sessions and kind of services. Um, uh, again, ongoing training support, I think that's critical for anything, especially with telehealth. We've seen so many changes in the last year, 18 months, uh, especially on the EHR vendor and technology side. And we actually recently did a complete kind of touchback and getting trying to everybody back to baseline because so much has changed. Uh, even just with Doximity and Zoom and how it's being used. And so continuing to provide that education and support is so key. Um, one thing we're moving towards is really giving the patient the choice or letting the patient decide the mode of, of how they would like to conduct their visit. Uh, and, you know, kind of through the pandemic, the providers were driving a lot of it, and especially at their comfort level. If they weren't comfortable, then they were, you know, even asking the patient. And so as we kind of shift back and, and everything's kind of going back through our call center and their scheduling centrally is, you know, based on the type of visit, if it's eligible for telehealth, we want that patient to be able to choose whether or not they want video or audio. Um, we're getting ready to uh, configure all of our exam rooms uh, for telehealth. Uh, we see that to be um, kind of the future and moving to, you know, better productivity uh, right now, it's either, you know, either a provider is in the office or they're out of the office. And if they're out of the office, they're able to do telehealth. What we want to be able to shift to is literally being able to see a patient, you know, at 10 o'clock and in the exam room. And at 1015, they could walk across the hall and conduct a telehealth visit from, the, from you know, another exam room. Uh, so we're in the process of configuring all of our exam rooms to cut down you know, on you know, providers being able to have to you know, bounce back and forth or only being able to do telehealth uh, from home. So we're excited about that. 
Um, we do run monthly metrics, uh, something that we've started a little over six or seven months ago of really being able to get a sense and gauge of the number of you know, telehealth visits that we're doing on a monthly basis. And then with those, how many of them are audio and how many of them are video. Uh, we're really trying to increase that video. I know there's been you know, talks about reimbursement models and whether or not continue to pay for audio. Uh, and so with some of that discussion, you know, we're really trying to push you know, providers to be with that comfort level and make sure everybody knows how to conduct those visits. And so we're continuing to target providers who may have you know, low numbers for the month or that we see you know, kind of dipping and providing one-on-one -on -one support or continuing education uh, for those folks. So I'd like to, to go ahead and end it there. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we need to switch over to um, Fenway Health. This was amazing information. All these slides will be available on our resources tab for everyone to access. Um, and Ryan, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, I'd love for you to be able to answer those while uh, Fenway Health pulls up their slides to get started. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, this is Chris Grasso from Family Health. I'm the Vice President for Informatics and Data. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting us to present today. I know we're on a quick, uh, short uh, time frame here, so we'll we'll try to kind of get all of our information in here. Um, I just, um, if I could ask my colleagues, uh, David to Disco and Emily to quickly introduce themselves as well. Hi all. Thank you again for inviting us from Family Health. David to Disco. I. Um, the Director of Behavioral Health here at Fenway Health, and I use he series pronouns. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Phillips. I use she series pronouns, and I am the Telehealth Project Manager for Fenway. Awesome, great. Um, if you could jump to the next slide, um, Emily, appreciate it. So um, um, just a quick overview of who Fenway is. We're FQHC, we're located in Boston, Massachusetts, and we're celebrating our 50th year. Um, our mission is really to deliver innovative and equitable care, particularly focusing on the LGBTQIA and BIPOC communities. Um, we are one of the largest service providers of HIV in the New England area. Um, and even though we're located in an urban area, even prior to COVID, we saw patients come from over a thousand zip codes. So it's, it wasn't um, uh, uh, rare to have patients traveling from Maine, New Hampshire, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island to receive care at Fenway. Um, but what really happened during the pandemic, as many of us, as many of you probably experienced as well, is that we really saw uh, our area, geographic area, expand, and we saw patients come from nearly 40 states to access care at Fenway. Um, some of these were existing patients who maybe moved uh, during the pandemic, but some of these were also brand new patients to our, our organization as well. Um, and like many FQHCs, we offer medical care, behavioral health care, uh, optometry, and dentistry. Uh, what probably makes us a little unique is our Fenway Institute, where we um, offer uh, uh, education, uh, policy, and have a large research department. Additionally, we have a number of uh, public health programs that focus on drug user health, uh, housing, uh, STI, and HIV. Um, next slide. And so basically, sort of similar to the other presenters, um, we had not been doing really any telehealth prior to the pandemic, although it's something that we had talked about at Fenway for a number of years. Um, so when the pandemic hit and we really had to make that pivot, like many of you, uh, we didn't necessarily have a lot in place. Um, and so it was really about within a matter of week that we made the pivot to telehealth. Um, we, uh, you know, um, initially started up in trends and um, uh, um, basically moved about 80% of our visits to telehealth. Initially, we started off with phone, but our intention was to move to video. And so I think like many of you, um, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty happening with that time, a lot of anxiety, both among our staff and our patients in terms of how we would continue to provide care. And so um, very early on in the get go, I felt like it was very important for us to be able to provide support to both our staff and our patients. Um, and so what we did is we out of the gate, we set up a telehealth support line. Um, and so this was mainly staffed by people who were in our clinical applications team. But we were also able to use support from some of our staff who maybe um, their job shifted because patients maybe weren't coming in as frequently and so they had available time. And so what we were able to do is, is provide basically on-demand support for our staff. And it was pretty important to have that really available for them out of the gate. And so um, we basically, as we'll show in the next slide, set up some, some phone lines and emails as well. Um, it also provided a safety net for providers who began working remotely. So we wanted to make sure that they had access to these services, um, not just when they were in the office, but also if they were doing telehealth remotely. 
Um, and we found that this really provided um, really a positive interaction for both our patients and our staff who are basically beginning to um, really navigate these new workflows. And you know, while many of, of us have become um, very adept at using you know, Zoom and all these video technologies now, um, this wasn't necessarily the case um, you know, a year and a half ago. So it was really important to sort of set that up from the get-go. We saw a high volume of utilization of our telehealth support services uh, very early on, but now we maybe get you know, one or two calls a week at this point. Um, next slide. And the specific type of support that we set up for organizations, we had a dedicated phone line, so we called it basically telehealth support. Um, through our, um, our uh, phone system, we have an internet-based phone system, we were also able to do instant messaging. So um, our staff could instant message you know, people, our clinical staff could in, 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 um, instant message the telehealth support staff and bring them into call immediately. So they didn't have to lose that patient or lose that visit. We could sort of resolve that issue right away. Um, we had a dedicated email address where people also could um, reach out to us maybe in advance of a meeting if a patient was concerned about their ability to, to get connected online. Um, but not only that, we also thought it was important to provide um, standard operating procedures for our staff and as well as branded virtual backgrounds. And so these were provided um, you know, um, as a way to sort of get everybody on the same page because we wanted to have a very uh, similar experience for our patients across the board. Um, regardless of who they were interacting with. So having lots of different resources, I think really helped um, sort of alleviate some of those, those bumps along the way. Um, it made people feel like they had a safety net that they could fall back on if they were having any issues around technology. Um, 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 after English, the most predominant language um, spoken within our patient population is Spanish. So when we developed our materials, it was very important to have those translated into Spanish as well. Um, so on our website, basically we have a dedicated website where we had, um, uh, you know, the, the materials both in English and Spanish, um, and uh, it was, you know, we 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 got great feedback from both our patients and our and our staff uh, that this was very uh, helpful. Um, and basically, what we also did is prior to the visit, we sent our patients a test URL via a text message, so they could actually test out their equipment in advance. If you slip, um, click to the next slide, Emily. This is an example of what we did. So basically the day before the visit, the patient would get a reminder saying, you know, hey, you have a visit with us tomorrow. You know, please click on the link in this embedded in this text message so you could test your equipment to make sure it worked. Um, we actually found that to be very helpful because, you know, we would, you know, it would also um, prevent a lot of those issues from happening on demand. So if a patient was logging into their visit, you know, um, you know, five minutes before and they're having problems and it's going to create, you know, um, issues and barriers for them to get care. So we really wanted to sort of prevent as many of those issues from happening early on. Um, next slide, Emily. So when the patient basically connected on um, uh, the link, they would be brought, as I said, to our website where they would see lots of FAQs and lots of information about how to get connected as well as information about our telehealth support line. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to David who's basically going to go over some of our ways in which we um, offered some low threshold, low barrier services in behavioral health. And then I'll turn it over to Emily, who will focus on some of the ways that our inter interdepartmental collaboration really supported our success. Thank you, Chris. So I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, and I'll actually put my email in the chat um, for any of you that want to follow up with me. Um, but my slides are pretty self-explanatory. So here at Fenway Health, we had prior to um, the COVID pandemic, a walk-in service um, for registered behavioral health clients. It's a low barrier uh, service where no appointment was uh, required. Uh, people could show up Monday through Friday from noon to four um, and be seen in person. And it uh, took us maybe just about four weeks or so um, before we were able to find a way with Chris's team's help, of course, to replicate that um, in a virtual way. Um, and this is a graphic that shows our virtual walk-in service. Emily, if you can go to the next slide, please. So just um, a glossary of terms that we use just to get our head around how to imagine the Zoom space um, as a replication of the client's experience. Um, so I'm not gonna linger on here because you all get the slide deck. Uh, but this is a glossary of kind of terms that we used for staff um, and to get our heads around it. Um, and so this is basically, um, I think you jumped ahead, there you go. Um, the workflow, um, let me go back, Emily, thank you. Uh, the workflow for the virtual behavioral walk-in service. 
Um, so uh, for patients that have um, uh, video access, um, they could use the Zoom. We did maintain the ability for people to be seen um, or receive care over the phone. Um, they were given the link. Um, and our patient service coordinator was like the air traffic controller um, for the service. Um, and they admitted the patient into the, um, the Zoom channel, uh, basically like greeted them as if they were entering the front desk area and got them situated in a therapy room. And then the service, the patient service coordinator um, got in touch with the, our behavioral health clinician, got them to jump into the Zoom room and got them situated in one of the breakout rooms that replicated uh, like several uh, therapy consult rooms. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, again, I'm gonna put my, um, email address in the chat, and I welcome any emails from you all if um, you'd like to ask uh, more specific questions. And then just before turning it over to my colleague, Emily, um, although we did not include it on the slide deck, one of the other things that we did at Behavioral Health is we developed three telehealth hubs at our main location, and that provided um, patients the ability to come on site um, and use one of the hubs to engage in telehealth care, um, specifically with behavioral health, but it was possible for them to use it for medical, uh, medical care as well. And that was intended to help those individuals that did not have reliable access um, to video or phone technology. So I'm gonna turn it over to Emily. Thanks, David. Um, and I'll be quick here for the sake of time. I know we have one more group presenting. Um, just some strategies for success. It really reiterates what uh, Chris and, excuse me, David uh, mentioned earlier. Um, but building a robust provider and staff uh, resources right from the get-go. Um, I recently heard a quote at a conference I attended. Some of you may have been there as well. Um, and it really resonated with me in regard to the work we're all doing around telehealth. Medicine moves at the speed of trust. And I think it's relevant as we embrace a new way of consuming and uh, delivering healthcare. So it's really important that we instill confidence in both our um, providers and our staff and patients. So, uh, you know, right from the beginning and choosing solutions that we know are reliable and then offering support for their use. As you mentioned, Chris said that we, uh, as you remember, Chris mentioned that we uh, equipped our providers with the technology to participate in telehealth, whether they were on site or at a remote office, and then offering real time support for, um, for any, any tech issues or other questions. And um, we launched a video platform pretty quickly uh, when the pandemic hit and set the expectation from the start um, of the pandemic that um, we're going to do telehealth and our preferred way would be video. So we would always sort of just send their messaging um, that it's a video first and audio as um, a resort to video if needed. And we had interdisciplinary teams um, for planning and quality assurance. So I think that leadership did a really great job of enabling um, multiple departments to collaborate and really figure out how um, we could best meet the needs of the patients and the providers. Um, that was a really important piece of this as well. And then um, engaging multiple departments, um, we really try to be inclusive in our telehealth planning. So it wasn't just behavioral health and medical that had access to telehealth. We worked with the dental and optometry as well to ensure that they had access to telehealth. And they use this um, either to treat their patients virtually or as a triage tool for an on-site visit if necessary. One of the cool things I just wanted to mention um, that came out of this that wasn't really, it was sort of an unforeseen positive um, outcome was that I think it really helped some collaboration between the different departments that, that hadn't been there before yeah, so easily. Yeah. Um, um, and so like to give you an example, if a patient presented with um, maybe a low acuity eye concern in the primary you're... care environment, I think somebody might be off mute. Um, but if they presented with a low acuity eye concern, that primary care provider often would reach out to optometry and say, hey, can you take a look at this and sort of do like a curbside consult in a way where we hadn't done that before because it wasn't logistically possible. 
Um, and then technical support uh, and guidance is like you heard Chris mention, there was every avenue to reach us, whether you wanted to call us or send a note online. Um, we were there for you both internally and to our, our patients. It was really important and sent the message of um, support. And I think also too, just letting patients know that we're still here for you. Like it almost felt like the world ended when the pandemic hit. And um, I think just having patients know that we're still here for you, but maybe just in a different way than you're used to was really important and valuable and that they could call us and we'll answer. We're not canceling all of their appointments. Um, we're still seeing you just sort of in a different way. And to get back to um, one of the original presenters point that, you know, what does the future of telehealth look like? Well, Hopefully it's here to stick around because it is really valuable. I think it's it's definitely proved its value um, in, the, in the recent pandemic and um, it's going to be a part of our programming going forward. So with that, I will go ahead and, and stop sharing and let the next group go. Um, I've asked Laura to give her presentation and stay as long as she's able. So if any of you are able to stay beyond four o'clock Eastern time, um, please hang out with us. Otherwise the recording will be available. Okay, um, so hello everyone. My name is Laura Rawwald. I work at um, the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center and we are part of the Texla TRC, uh, Telehealth Week telehealth resource center. Um, so as part of the, the Texla TRC, we have conducted multiple surveys and interviews with the FQHCs in the state of Texas um, regarding best practices, any needs they had when implementing their telehealth programs. Um, and I've kind of compiled just a, um, oops, sorry, um, a summary of best practices that we have learned um, from interviewing multiple uh, FQHCs in our area. Um, all right. So I kind of broke it down into three different slides. Streamlining the telehealth process is the first one here. Um, most of our centers had some form of a telehealth navigator or a patient access representative, like some of the previous um, presenters have talked about, somebody that was dedicated to helping patients navigate and get on so they would kind of first give an overview of what to expect or provide resources when the appointment was first scheduled. They'd be there to assist the patient as needed to get connected the day of, send reminders, help them get reconnected if, if the call or the video was disconnected for whatever reason. Um, and that was said to be very, very helpful, especially as this was all new to everybody and especially with the older populations um, that weren't, weren't quite as um, tech savvy potentially needed that extra support. And some of the clinics in our area found that if they used a telehealth platform that was integrated with their electronic medical records, that helped, especially in the case when patients already had a patient portal through that system. Um, but on the other hand, some did find that the telehealth platform associated or that was integrated with their EMR was not very user friendly or, or did not meet their needs as, as they were hoping. Um, so some actually reported the opposite, that they had switched to Zoom Health instead of using the integrated version, just so that patients didn't have the same level of frustration as they had been having trying to connect. Um, one thing that was also mentioned was a waiting room feature uh, that was available on some telehealth platforms right from the beginning, some not at all, and some it was implemented later, it sounds like. Um, and that reportedly helped a lot um, with just keeping the flow going. So a patient could log into their appointment ahead of time, make sure they were all set up, their audio was working, video was working, everything was good to go. And the doctor or the provider could see that they were there and ready for the appointment, but it wouldn't start the appointment right away. So I, um, we heard multiple times that the waiting room feature was very helpful. Um, and then this should go out without saying, but always keeping the patient needs in mind and trying to update workflows and, and work processes as needed. Um, so most of the health centers, pretty much all of the health centers that we interviewed had some kind of a patient satisfaction survey that they would send out after visits, telehealth or otherwise. Um, and then based on whatever kind of responses they got, whatever kind of phone calls came in with either complaints or congratulations, whatever it was, they would bring that into meetings, discuss, and then change things as needed based on the feedback that they got. Um, another thing 
regarding this point is that they would try to match telehealth navigators as best they could to patients. And kind of what I mean by that is language was one of the biggest examples. Um, so if somebody's first language was Spanish, then they would try to make sure that that person was routed to a Spanish speaking telehealth navigator as well. So they could switch between languages or be talking in, in whatever language, speaking in whatever language the, the patient was comfortable, most comfortable in. Um, so next we kind of talked about overcoming patient access issues. Here in the state of Texas, we have quite a lot of rural space. Um, so that comes with a, a lot of challenges just regarding um, staying connected, keeping connected, and even having access to necessary technologies. Um, so most of our centers in the area had some kind of a dedicated um, IT support telephone line that patients could call into. Um, and then again, the telehealth navigators, as previously discussed, that was something quite a few uh, centers did employ. And some of those, some of that happened with employees that were no longer able to do their full job because of COVID restrictions being redeployed into these positions. So a lot of times the telehealth navigator was um, a very prominent position up front in the beginning during implementation and kind of in the beginning stages of, of implementing a telehealth program. And a lot of them have kind of phased back either how many they have, the hours that they're available, things of that nature, just because um, at this point, a lot of pretty much all of the providers have had some experience. And then a lot of the patients have had some experience with telehealth at this point as well. Um, and then next, many of our centers pretty much all had some kind of a a teaching a tutorial or or something that their patient could access. So either if that was posted on their website, if it was something they physically handed to the patient when they were in the clinic, something to assist the client in becoming more familiar and comfortable with telehealth and um, being able to get connected, going through all the steps of, okay, this is how you download Zoom. If you're in Zoom Health, this is how you click here and here to get to where you need to go, things of that nature. And that was um, also said to alleviate frustration a lot or a lot of the frustrated calls that would come to IT. Um, one thing that might be unique to Texas because of how rural we are, perhaps not, um, but a lot of our centers here ended up offering some kind of a drive up or curbside service. So for patients in rural areas, especially that didn't have the bandwidth to connect to a video visit, especially didn't have reliable cellular service to connect to a telephone visit even, or if they didn't have technologies such as an iPad or a laptop um, to be, or a smartphone to be able to connect, um, then for some of those patients, they would drive into the clinic, they, they'd get connected to the clinic's Wi-Fi, often with a clinic provided iPad or you know, tablet, whatever the device was, the telehealth navigator or support staff from inside of the clinic would get it all set up. So all the client had to do was press start when, when the clinic staff walked it out to their car. And that way it was kind of an in-between modality. You were kind of there. So in this case, it was preferred for if people really couldn't get connected, um, like I already mentioned, but also if they needed labs drawn or vitals taken, things of that nature. This really worked because they were they were there if needed, um, but they were still doing a virtual visit with the provider actually in the building. And then another thing that we heard quite a bit is um, patients would get directed to public hotspots, whether that be at a library um, or whatever the case was, if and they would connect in their car. So that worked well in some cases, in some cases, not really. Um, all right, and then the last slide that I have here was regarding keeping patients engaged. So some of our FQHCs in Texas here uh, reported that they sent out mass text messages to inform their patients that telehealth was an option when it was first implemented, because um, again, like I said before, they most of the health centers did not have any telehealth um, program at all when the COVID pandemic hit. So this was new for pretty much all of our centers. Um, some had very limited programs, um, which they expanded upon greatly as, as was needed <laughs> during the start of the pandemic here. But that was one way that clinics used to get the word out about any updated COVID policies, um, where you could find resources on how to connect to a visit, 
things of that nature. And just again, in the beginning to let patients know, hey, it's an option, you can still have your appointment and this is how we'll do it, even though the clinic is actually shut down. Um, a lot of centers also connected either on their website, providing resources um, that way or through social media as well. And then a lot of, yeah, most of them did some kind of a reminder. I think that's pretty standard but that also helped with keeping patients engaged. Um, and we did actually have a report that the, the no-show rate was significantly lower for telehealth visits versus in-person visits. So that's interesting as well. And then the last point I have here is some of our health centers, especially the ones in the most rural areas, reported collaborating with community leaders um, to try to get the word out. So that would, look something like the administrator at the clinic um, happens to know the, you know, a spiritual leader in the community and they would just chat and be like, hey, if you wouldn't mind, let your parishioners know that telehealth is an option. They should still be keeping on top of their healthcare appointments as able and, and we'd be happy to see them this way. So that was another way that some of, especially the more rural clinics, um, utilized resources or connections within their community to really get the word out. Like, this is an option. Please come see us if you need it. Um, we have a bunch of resources for you, so just let us know what you need. And yeah, and that's it. I'm sorry to rush through. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone who was able to stay on. Um, we have uh, some representatives from the telehealth resource centers who are here uh, to check on the questions that you've asked so far and to um, help to provide some resources. The uh, slideshow, the presentations that were given today um, will be available on the resources tab. I didn't release them ahead of time just to encourage you all to be here for those. Um, also, as soon as the Zoom platform processes this recording, we will uh, upload that as well. Um, I want to give folks a chance just to ask any questions if they have any, um, but also aware of the time. Please feel free to log off if you need to. I uh, really appreciate everyone being here, and uh, I will be quiet now and give you folks a chance to unmute and ask any questions you might have of the folks who are still here. Oh, and the other thing, just real quick, I want to make sure everyone knows that as a registered participant, you will have access to the email addresses of all of the registered participants and the presenters. So when the um, resources page is updated, you'll be able to see those and, and contact any of the presenters in case you didn't scribble down their email addresses here. So the recording is going to be um, among the resources in the resources tab on the connect platform. So you should have gotten an email with an updated link and you'll see that I'll upload it as soon as I, uh, as soon as I have it.